Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the study. And uh, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we invite your presence here this morning. We know you have something to say to us. And we just ask that we can have open hearts and minds to receive light into our darkened darkened minds and heart. We know, Lord, that uh, there are things that we need to see about our, ourselves and our relation to the events that occur around us and also in our interactions with others. We just pray, Lord, that you can correct us in our understanding. Be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning again. So did I share my screen? No, not yet. Okay, let's do that. Thought I had, but I guess I didn't hit the button properly. So we've been looking at, at 1 Samuel chapter 2. Just a, a quick sort of summary. Last week we we made a suggestion that uh, chapter 2 is, is a representation of the three angels' messages. We have verse 12 to 17 that represents the first angel's message. Uh, verses 18 and 19, the second angel and 20 and 21, the third angel. And we applied it to our history. But in the last study, we sort of zoomed out a bit. That is, we, instead of applying it to our history, we were applying it to the broader range of the Adventist church. So I, I, I took some consideration regarding this. So we had the first part, of course, dealing with the, the sons of Belial was that verse uh, 12 to 17. And uh, so we, we kind of need to look at this a little bit more in detail again. And then this one dealing with the ephod, uh, this linen ephod, and this coat. So we spent some time dealing with that. And then we also had, uh, I'm trying to remember some of this. So, And then this section here, uh, the blessing of Elkanah and his wife. Now, hmm, so uh, well, what I'll do is I'll, I'll look at this here. So I'm going to switch the screen. So this is uh, the chart I made. Now you can see I've, I've doubled it because what I want to do is I want to uh, do the chart on the bottom uh, to deal with the same verses but apply it differently, whether that makes sense or not. So not quite sure how to do this, but let's look at the, the chart itself. So we have 1 Samuel 2, verse 1 to 11. Now that's going to be Hannah's prayer, right? So we're saying that that, that is, uh, that whole story of Hannah precedes uh, December 21st, 2012. And then we have 1 Samuel 2, verse 12 to 17, represents 2012 to 2017. And uh, that's 1,737 days in that period of time. Whether that's significant, I just put the number there. And then September 23rd, 2017, that's going to be a presentation I did at Lambert Church in which uh, I present July 18th as a symbol of the prediction before midnight, because that's something we were talking about in 2017, had to do with Samuel Snow's letters. So initially, we knew Samuel Snow had his first letter that was published on February 22nd, 1844. And uh, Tabo, well, it was actually Blessings, who discovered the May 2nd letter, his second letter of Samuel Snow prior to midnight. And so Tabo uh, touted that as the symbol of the prediction before midnight. And then I continued to study and look and find that there was actually two other letters. There was the June 22nd letter, which was a Pentecost letter, and also uh, a July 18th letter that uh, was published on July 18th, three days before midnight. And Tabo had suggested that three days was a symbol of the prediction before midnight. Also, I noticed that um, his first letter was originally published on February 22nd, but it was written on February 16th. 
in 1844, published six days later in The Midnight Cry. And then it was republished in The Signs of the Times on April 3rd in 1844. April 3rd was the Passover according to the Jews in 1844. And, and May 2nd was the correct Passover according to October 22nd being the 10th day of the seventh month. So we had this, uh, probably should bring up that diagram, I guess. Um, but uh, anyway, that structure of Samuel Snow's letters, and we'll probably look at that in a little bit more detail as we deal with uh, some of these other dates, because there's going to be more dates put on this line on the top that relate to the, that line. And so we're trying to understand exactly how this line relates to Millerite history. But that means that the line below should have some relation to Millerite history. Does, does that make sense to people? That we can, we can take these dates in our history and we can line them up with Millerite history below. Does that, that make sense? That would seem logical. Okay. Now we know in Millerite history, the first and second angels messages, uh, we're going to have the third angel's message arrives, arrives October 22nd, 1844, right? Now, in every reform line, we have a first angel arrive. We have a formalization of a message. We have an empowerment of that message. And then the next message arrives, right? So in Millerite history, we have the first angel arrives, 1798. It's going to be formalized when Miller is ordained as a minister, right? And then in 1833, and then it's going to be empowered August 11th, 1840. The second angel arrives on the first disappointment, April 19th, 1844. It's formalized when the midnight cry is given on July 21st, and then it's empowered at Exeter on August 15th. And then the third angel arrives October 22nd, 1844. And we know that the third angel, when it arrives, uh, that it's never empowered in any line, right? So that, that message, there's always a falling away that occurs after the arrival of the third message. And, and this is something that this movement has known for a long, long time before I came into the movement. And they used to have these lines drawn out in a little bit more detail that we later, uh, drew them out, we would sort of just put the highlights, but they would always have, you know, increase of the message. There would always be a number seven associated with the third angel arriving. You know, they have the work of the enemies, uh, revival. They would have all these different things in these lines, which we generally leave out. So in, in our history, when we're looking at this line, we're looking at this message regarding Samuel. There is we're saying that that Samuel is a message, right? A specific message in in our line in our history. We're applying it that way, but it would also represent, as as all reform lines do, they all can be parallel with each other. And the primary reform line, of course, is Millerite history. And so, in in every in every reform line, there is a period of darkness. Right. That precedes a reform line and a reform line always addresses that particular darkness. And we saw this, of course, in detail when we went through understanding the lines and we could see that um, that in each sort of story, it's like a, um, you know, an, an anatomy book where you have the different uh, transparencies that go over top of each other to build, uh, you know, the human body. And, and that's sort of what these lines are like. Each each story uh, gives us more detail and and adds different elements to our understanding of that history. So if we're going to address this story in 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 Samuel chapter two, we would have to say that there is some particular light that this story illustrates, and that it is a response to some particular type of darkness. Now, the fact that we have these sons of Belial, Hophni and Phinehas, and um, that they're, they're part of this story, and 
you know, exactly how we're going to deal with this. I don't know, like how we're going to sort through exactly what this is telling us. We, we have some hints and ideas that, that this is about the movement and its uh, inability to, to recognize its true spiritual condition and that God has given us this message in relation to time to, to reveal that to the movement. Does, does that all seem reasonable so far? Yes. Okay. And so when we, we, when we, we constructed this line, or I did actually, I put this line up, not during a study, but uh, in between our studies, I, we had said that, well, we have these verses, uh, verse 12, chapter 2, verse 12 represents 2012, and chapter 2, verse 21 represents 2021, and, and that there's some kind of correlation between these verse numbers and these years and we did the similar thing in judges chapter two which means also the fact that it's chapter two relates uh to the second angel's message but also it was in 20 right the 20s 2001 judges chapter two verse one represented 9 11 in 2001 and it went up to 2023 and it related specifically to the history we were in at that, that time now we also note that this is an application that God gives us for us to understand at the present time. It's not the application of these verses. So for somebody who's who's not a part of this movement and they, you know, see us uh, dealing with these lines and as if, you know, this is what these verses only mean, well, obviously that's not our position. So we're looking for light for our feet. And, you know, that may be a little bit of myopia on our part, but I believe it's in God's providence that he's He's led us in this way to, to understand these verses. But we also need to understand them in the larger context. That is uh, how they relate to the bigger lines of Millerite history. And, and also just in their original reform line right we need to understand that there is a reform that was occurring at that time as well so that bigger context gives us light regarding how we are making our application right that is we understand that if that we first need to to see how this relates to that history what what is the story and in this story one of the things that we saw is that there is this thread of the everlasting gospel that relates to the promised seed. And so this prayed for child uh, relates to uh, those seeking to have a Christ-like character. Does that make sense to people? That was a long sentence sort of thing. It's an interesting thought. It, it does make sense. Okay. Yeah, it's just we have this promised seed. The seed of the woman would bruise the serpent's head. The serpent would bruise his heel. That's the everlasting gospel, right? And, and we know that the everlasting gospel is the three-step testing prophetic message that develops and demonstrates two classes of worshipers. So when we are studying the scriptures, we're, we're not studying this for some sort of curiosity about, you know, uh, events that are going to happen so that we can predict things. This is about us wanting to develop a Christ-like character, that Christ can be born in us. And so the women who always are expecting that their child that they're going to have is going to be the promised seed is an important detail of the everlasting gospel, an important thread of the everlasting gospel. And Bible chronology, the whole reason that we are given Bible chronology is actually to follow through uh, that promised seed, right? So the stories, the history of the Bible is about the story of the everlasting gospel. The thought that, the thought that comes to my mind when you're talking about it, that uh, promised seed is kind of like when we're searching the scriptures, we're looking for that to, uh, I don't know, to be, to be brought out and <clears throat> brought out in the scriptures in our lives for the mm -hmm. promised seed of Christ yep. uh, as we search scripture. Yeah. Now it may seem a little bit abstract to some people, I think, 
you know, there's uh, some people are a little more concrete thinkers, but if, if we think about, uh, you know, each of these stories in, in scripture, we can see that, you know, if we go back to Abraham, we have, you know, he's called, you know, out of Babylon, right. To go to the land of promise and and he's given a promise in regard to this covenant regarding the seed. His seed would be as the stars of heaven. Now, so that promise, that <clears throat> that inheritance, that is the promise of the promised seed, is Abraham is the one chosen for that seed to come from. And then, of course, Isaac is going to carry that on, and then Jacob. And then Jacob divides that that birthright. Uh, among his his 12 sons so that joseph gets the double portion levi gets the priesthood and judah gets the kingship right and and then we follow through how israel now is in a sense the promised seed right as as a whole even though you know only three of the sons get that but you know christ he's going to be um, a priest after the order of Melchizedek rather than than Levi or the Aaronic priesthood, right? But he's still going to receive the kingship because the scepter shall not depart from Judah. And so it's going to be David who is of the tribe of Judah who's going to uh, be this king that is it's typifying Christ, right? A man after his own heart, um, God says, right? And and Christ is going to be the son of David, so he's going to his genealogy is going to be followed through, uh, and through the kings of Judah, and then uh, the scepter, it says, will not depart from Judah until Shiloh come. But we know that in uh, the captivity, the the Babylonian captivity, eventually Babylon is going to conquer the kings of Judah. And he's going to overturn, overturn, overturn it. That is from Babylon taking it. It's going to be overturned to Medo Persia, overturned to Greece, overturned to Rome. And then he shall come whose right it is. Right. So so we, we're going to see that there's this this overturning that happens. And then Christ is going to become king. But still, even though he's the king of glory, when he enters into heaven, he doesn't assume his his role as the king until after the work of being a priest, right? So there's there's a lot of complexity. There's lots of these lines that that are not generally understood or at least put together in any sort of cohesive way. So this movement has been able to do this. And we're still in the process of figuring some of this out, all of the details. But um, the idea that we have here is that there is something being illustrated about this movement. And the main thing that we see in relation to the movement has to do with our lack of the character of Christ. So it's related to this line, but then we have to say, well, that's what happens in the story of, of Samuel, this child that's going to be born, the sons of Belial, and then this obviously uh, this second angel's message doing dealing with Samuel and uh, the ephod and his coat that his mother makes for him. And then the blessing that that uh, Elkanah and his wife receive in having three sons and two daughters. And so so we have to try to figure out how that all fits together. And, and I've I've thought about it. I don't think I have any of those answers yet. But. When we were dealing with it on Thursday, how were we addressing this this whole issue with the church itself? <clears throat> where where were we placing this this history, the sons of Belial, in relation to the church? Does anybody remember what we did, <clears throat> what we were saying on Thursday? Was how are we applying? How are we applying the sons of Belial to the? The leadership of the church current day is uh yeah because we were talking about well we were applying it in some way to uh so we we're applying it first to a line that had to do with our big line so this line that you see here in front of you even though it's double that's the same line um 
this line here is just dealing with this movement. But we did apply it to uh, 1989, 9-11, et cetera, right? So we applied it, we zoomed out a little bit into our line that parallels Millerite history. We haven't applied it to Millerite history yet, but I'm suggesting that we would have to do that, exactly how we're going to, but that's that's how we were addressing it on on Thursday. So nobody particularly remembers. I know I don't remember all the details. Of it. So um, question in short form again, just say it. Well, how were, we asking... applying, how were we applying it? Does anybody remember how we were applying this line, this story of Samuel to the Seventh-day Adventist church in our history? Because we, we were covering that history. Oh, isn't it what you just said, like 1989 and 9-11? Yeah. But exactly like... how, where were we putting the Sons of the Wild? Did we deal with the ephod? Um, I, I don't think we, we completed that, right? So yeah, we, we kind of started on it. And uh, so, hang a second here. So pe pe nobody remembers anything? I mean, I don't, I know I don't remember all the details of what we discussed. I'm not recalling anything clearly. Okay. So you're asking basically how the story of Eli and Samuel and so on okay. applies to the church okay i'm just looking through the transcript here because we were dealing with we were actually moving a little bit further ahead we were dealing with eli because we were reading lots of spirit of prophecy at least some of it and let me see here i should have gone over my my video again All right so we dealt with what happened with, uh, you know, the church in regard to 9-11 and some of the corruption within the church as a parallel to the sons of Belial, right? That's, that was basically the idea. That's where we spent quite a bit of time because we read Spirit of Prophecy in that regard. And then we talked about yeah. five, right? Yeah. Tenth being a remnant from Isaiah chapter six. And then we dealt with the ark and the two tables, right? So we we, we dealt with the idea that uh, about, and that's going to be later on that we're going to look at that. So we were talking about how I'm glory has departed. I'm wondering how how it fits in with uh, the scholars. I don't know how many now, but. And how far it's reached, even to the Biblical Research Institute, perhaps, of the the questioning of, well, uh, our prophetic understanding, like like Neil Wilson saying that way back, that Mark, that the beast being the Catholic Church is an old understanding belongs in the trash heap or something like that, or or recent, more recent scholars denying the 2300 days. Yeah, well, and it's just so much the scholarship. It would just be uh, people who graduate from our institutions. Um, right. Don't believe the scholars that, are teaching those. Yeah, the so the are teaching those. Yeah, general. So, I mean, there is still a conservative class of scholars within Adventism. But they've been slowly eroding uh, the prophetic foundation. So obviously you're not going to have many scholars accepting the, the pioneer understanding of Revelation 9. I only know of two scholars that, that, that so those accept. Scholars, those scholars we know. Sorry. We, we know that those scholars, that there's good and good men that God still has. Yeah. Um, but it's but not even to be like dumb dogs dumb dogs yeah. that aren't barking because I, I don't hear much pro protest over well, that the idea be. that there's no 2300 days. Yeah, so, but but just dealing with Revelation 9, you, so you have Ron Dupree and um, uh, Trevier. There's two Adventist scholars that support Revelation 9 as, as the pioneers' understanding, at least on some level. 
<clears throat> so that we have August 11th, 1840. But the vast majority of scholars don't accept uh, the understanding, pioneer understanding of the trumpets, right? Which would include, of course, uh, Revelation 9, the fifth and sixth trumpet. Which when, is. How would you say that changed? Well, well did most, most of Adventism accept that? Or? August 11, 1840, up until. Well, I mean, it, it was. It, it, it happens gradually. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, through, you know, after, uh, definitely after 1957, we saw uh, more and more that uh, people who were rejecting prophetic messages, the foundation became more and more brazen. So it's it's not like it just happened in one day. It's, it happens gradually over time. It's not like scholars change their minds. It's just new generation comes along and questions uh, the teachings of the previous generation. And so a foundation is laid in, in Adventist education. So a lot of our scholars, you know, were raised Adventists. And uh, so it's just gradually creeps in generation after generation. And so the fourth generation forgets the first generation. Mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> and that's that's what's happened in Adventism. So that's why the fourth generation as a symbol, you know, 1957 marks the beginning of the fourth generation. And the reform line always occurs in a fourth generation. So there's there's a lot of information that we would have to that we still are addressing that, that we, we haven't addressed. Right. So we deal with the sons of Belial. Now, in some ways, because we're going to have in this bigger line, we're going to have Saul, David, and Solomon representing the, the three angels' messages, right? Those three kings who each reigned for 40 years, in a period of 120 years. And, you know, so, so we can see a parallel, for instance, between uh, the sons of Belial and Saul, right? So we're going to see lots of different parallels. This is going to be a very interesting study going through Samuel. But can we see that the sons of Belial to some degree represent Saul's ministry, right? The first angel's message. How so? Like I see how Saul fell through spiritualism. Would it have anything to do with yeah, the, the formation coming into the church? Any connection there, you think? Uh, uh, well, no. Um no, no. I'm, I'm, see, that's where we're going to have to sort out these lines, exactly what we're looking at. So what ends up happening with the lines is we know that we have we have this bigger line that goes right from creation to, you know, from the creation of, of the earth, heaven and earth, to the new heaven and earth. And then each of these waymarks, there's seven major waymarks, and then we can zoom into a waymark, and then we have uh, other reform lines. Right, which all have waymarks. And then we zoom into those waymarks and there's other reform lines. So it's like a fractal. You just keep zooming in and you still get uh, the same pattern again and again. So we have to look at each aspect of a line. What is the prominent uh, ideas within a line? But we know that, that Saul's going to have his own reform line and David has his own reform line. And Solomon has his. So Saul, David, and Solomon each have their own reform lines. In those, in those fractals, do you notice anything that would uh, line up with Fibonacci sequence at all? Yeah. The fingerprint mm -hmm. of God and creation. Yeah, well, we, we have that in uh, dealing with uh, the 220 years of... Um, from 677 to 457 BC, there's periods of 70 years, and uh, and um, and then we had so that's going to give you pi. Like if you take uh, 220 divided by 70 is pi. That is the smallest fraction that approximates pi is 22 divided by 7. And then we had um, the Fibonacci sequence dealing with. Uh, you know, I'm trying to remember exactly how we did that. That was back in 2016 when I looked at that. Stephen might remember how we worked the Fibonacci sequence. Though. But 
we have Fibonacci showing up in other ways. So the Fibonacci... I'm, I'm thinking. I'm thinking of the. I'm thinking of the lines. Like, is that what you're referring to? Yeah. How, yeah. We, how the lines work. Well, yes. Yeah, so, are they a Fibonacci sequence all the time? No. I mean, but no. It's... But do we see it in places? I guess. As we zoom in to us, I don't know. I don't know. Yes. Just... Yeah, we do. So it's 1.618, right? That's the Fibonacci number. Let's see what I'm here. Sounds um, familiar. I don't remember yeah, it as a decimal. Here in my, my chart. But um, we had it dealing with, um, you know, Peter. Um, so that's going to be, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, I can't remember right now. Uh, it shows again and again. Stephen? Matthew 16, 1 8. Yeah, Matthew 16 verses 18. Yes, so you have what the 1 6 1 8? Yep, and that's going to be uh, when Jesus is talking to Peter. And, and we know that the name Peter, if we take the letters of Peter and we multiply the gematria, we get 144,000 or something. Is that what it is? I'm trying to remember. Uh, you just yeah, you just take the letters as they are in the uh, English alphabet. Yeah. So P, what's eighteen? Is it or sixteen? Yeah. Then you have the P being sixteen, and then the R being eighteen as well. And the name Peter. Okay. Yeah. So Peter starts with the sixteen and ends with an eighteen because P is the sixteenth letter. And R is the 18th letter. But if you multiply them together, you get 144,000, right? Is that what it is? The name Peter? Yes. Yes. Okay. And that's in Matthew 16, 18. But there's tons of other places where we run into this, this symbol. Um, I just can't remember them all at the moment. And, of course, we know that this is where it says the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This is actually in Paneum, right? And and that's referred to as the gates of hell. So upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So, so there's lots of different things. There's lots of different threads that we could go down uh, different lines. But the main thing here is that, uh, we can we can take these these lines and we can zoom out right so we can zoom out we can zoom in we're going to see the same thing and so it can be confusing because we have multiple reform lines and what we did when we went through understanding the lines is we were able to differentiate them we were able to to pull them out of the structures and we did that through the various symbols that were being used uh, sometimes gematria, sometimes uh, the Strong's numbers. They would give us spans of times and dates in, in various ways that that would confirm our analysis that we had already derived from the verses themselves. So in Saul, we're going to see that Saul is going to have a reform line. But we have right now a reform line dealing with with Samuel in chapter 2. And so when we went through Judges, remember that we had said that in the book of Judges, it was going, once we got to chapter two, we recognized it was going to illustrate uh, the history of this movement from 9-11 to 2023. And we kept finding that to be each, to be the case. So when we examined each judge, each judge was a reform line. And it was basically miraculous to, 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 to discover those structures, right? So we're, we're not going to go back and look at those now, but anybody who wants to can go back and look at, uh, one is we have a paper on it. There's two different papers, I guess. There's the notes from the prophecy uh, school that we had at the conference at Telford Muse. So there's videos on that, but there's also papers on my academia site. One is the notes for that. And also um, I, I just like, Dwight did presentations, Stephen did presentations, Iran and I did. But also just my notes are also in academia as a separate uh, 
set of notes to deal with all of those lines. So, so we're going to be finding something similar. That is, what we have here is we have this initial template, and and we believe that this that these that the Book of Samuel, First Samuel more specifically, um, uh, maybe well maybe First and Second Samuel I guess. Uh, they're going to cover all of that history of, of well, they're going to cover, what, what does 2 Samuel cover? How far does it go? That's what I'm trying to remember. Just up to David, right? Yeah. Yeah, so we're so in Samuel, we're going to get Samuel, we're going to get Saul, and we're going to get David, but that's as far as, as, as Samuel goes. It's not going to go into Solomon. That's where you're going to get kings. Right. When you get Solomon. OK, so even though we're starting here with Samuel, Samuel's not going to cover all of this history. We have to do first and second Samuel and then first Kings, at least part of first Kings dealing with, with Solomon. So but we, yeah. since, we're, since we're going. In this with Samuel, where we go with. The king, Saul, David, Solomon. Yeah. Is that a mirror image of what we've seen with the church? I don't know what you mean by a mirror image. You have to explain what you mean by a mirror here. I don't. Saul was a king that was not dependent on God. He was more self-seeking. David was wholly dependent on God. Sam or Solomon was later. So we have. Are you saying a mirror or a parallel? I see a parallel. I don't see a mirror. Okay. So you need to explain the mirror part of it. I was I was looking at mirror, but it wouldn't work if Samuel is going, or excuse me, if um, Solomon is going to be in Kings. Yeah, well, he's in the Book of Kings, yeah. So what, what we're going to get to when you get to the end of 2 Samuel is uh, we're going to have... Uh, David is going to do that census, right? That's as far as it's going to go in in 2 Samuel. It's just to the census. And then, so, yeah, we got to get to there. There's a lot of stuff in 2 Samuel. So so it's going to go through all of the problems with, with David, uh, Nathan rebuking David. Not sure why it's all in Second Samuel, because Samuel's gone by then, but uh, that's how the books are named. Yeah, so there's lots of things that we <laughs> – this is going to be pretty detailed study. It's going to take us a long time just to get through First Samuel, and then we got Second Samuel. Now, now Second Samuel is, is going to deal with, you know, David. So First Samuel deals with Saul. Second Samuel deals with David. Uh, first Kings is going to deal with um, uh, the end, you know, of David, but basically it's going to be Solomon, right? So it's going to be about uh, Solomon, and then halfway through it's going to be the end of Solomon, and you're going to have Rehoboam and Jeroboam, and then all the kings that uh, go up to basically the time of Ahab, and then Second Kings is going to go from Ahab all the way to, uh, um, you know, Zedekiah, right? So, so, to, and then Chronicles is going to uh, go through all of that history right from <clears throat> basically uh, the whole history of the Bible up until uh, the end of Zedekiah. So it's going to cover that whole history. First and Second Chronicles, right? So, so you know, we're going to have some repetition. Uh, whether we're going to go through First and Second Chronicles or not, I don't know. I think probably depends on how long the, you know, before Jesus comes back, because this takes us a long time. So we just don't know where we're going to go. Uh, but the main point that I'm trying to get here, as we start to look at this, is that we have something that applies to our line. But we already were zooming out on Thursday. That is, we were, were looking at how this applied to the church. Because 
it was pretty evident that it applies to the church. And but if it if it's if it applies to our bigger line, you know, from November 9th, uh, 1989 to, you know, the Sunday law, the, the end of time and, and close of probation and all those things, if, if it applies to that, then it also applies to Millerite history. And so the question is, you know, how are we going to sort out these lines as we did in the book of Judges, right? So where are our lines? And, and and that means our line, this line that we have here on the screen, is a <clears throat> is a zoom into a way mark, right? So so we found that that this movement basically is a zoom into 9/11. That that all of this stuff that we had dealing with uh, July 18th was uh, zooming into the arrival of the second angel's message in our history which is 9-11, and that we have not come to midnight on the line that Jeff had created back in 2016, where we have 9-11, midnight, midnight cry, Sunday law. Now, we've approached and, and, and can't come to midnights and midnight cries in, in smaller reform lines, but that on that line, we're not to midnight yet, not that we know of. We haven't reached midnight. And for somebody, you know, watching this, because I'm trying to go through this for people who are just watching this series and haven't gone through the other series in detail, that, you know, this this way mark of midnight is when a message has been formalized. And I'm of the opinion that our message has not been formalized yet. It hasn't been given because that message has to be given to the church, because between midnight and the midnight cry, Adventism, that is not the organizational structure, but the the, uh, the Levites, right? They will receive this message and proclaim it. Now, it will be empowered at some point, which is the midnight cry. And, that, and that's going to precede the Sunday law itself, right? So within Adventism, we have this, this reform line. Now, on there still is a bigger reform line. So... Ellen White compares the midnight cry in Millerite history to the loud cry in our history. I'm, I'm just going to go back through some of these lines. Uh, I don't know where how to find this here, but um, let's go back somewhere. Okay, where are we here? Okay, that's in Judges. Yeah, there's tons, tons of diagrams, and I need to organize these and get them a little more. Um, let me see here if I can find a simple line. Boy, uh, there was Moses line. There's line to the right. Okay, so this would be, this is what I want. Okay, so when we look at this line at the bottom, I have Abraham's line there. But we can see that in Millerite history, we have uh, 1798, increase of knowledge, uh, the struggle that goes on that uh, that we were using in in connection with uh, how we were studying that line, 9-11, 18, no, this isn't the one I want. This was, yeah, Miller's personal line. I don't want Miller's personal line. Okay, we have the cosmic line. Let me see, Noah, we went through his Abraham cosmic line, literal Israel, yeah. It should be back here somewhere. You can see there's a lot, a lot of slides here. Way too many. Well, this one might work. Okay, so here we have uh, Millerites, Protestants, Millerites. So the top line there is, is our simple line, 1798, 1833, August 11th, 1840. Then we have April 19th at sunset, right, because midnight is going to be halfway. Uh, between sunset and the Sunday law or the close of probation, right? Now, Ellen White parallels uh, the midnight cry to the loud cry. And this still isn't quite the right diagram, but the one above. Yeah, this one might this be better. Okay. So, so yeah, this is the line I want. Okay. 
So we can see Millerite history there. Um, I have that little Samuel Snow's letters there uh, from February 16th to July 18th, and then the three days before midnight. And then below, you see our line. The time of the ends, 1989, it parallels 1798. 1996, the formalization of the message, parallels 1833. And 9-11, as the arrival of, or the empowerment of the first angel's message, parallels August 11th, 1840. So that's the restraint of Islam. And then you have 9-11 uh, also representing the arrival of the second angel's message in this line. And we can see that the midnight cry in this line, we're lining up within this movement, right? So this all precedes the Sunday law, but this is still a zoom into a line because Ellen White parallels the midnight cry with the loud cry and the loud cry comes after the Sunday law. But here we have the midnight cry just as in Millerite history, preceding the Sunday law. So this was a confusion within the movement that existed, right? Because we know that the second angel joins the third angel at 9-11, and it swells into a loud cry. And Ellen White parallels the loud cry with the midnight cry. So do, are people understanding what I'm saying? Restate that, please. Okay, so here I'm I'm showing that this line where we have Seventh Day Adventists and Levites, this is the line that Jeff had, but this is not the line that Ellen White had. That is our line at the bottom. Ellen White never has this line. She's going to have. This is the line that Ellen White has. She has the close of probation, October twenty second, eighteen forty four, right? As the arrival of the third angel's message, and then. We're going to have the second angel arrive and join the third angel, right, at the Sunday law, right? We, we have their third and fourth angel's message, but that's the second angel joining. She doesn't have it happen at 9-11. She has it happen at the Sunday law. Right. And then the loud cry follows, and then the close of probation. Okay, so this is Ellen White's line, correct? This is how we would understand it as Seventh-day Adventists. There's would no nine. What? I would have to agree. Okay. So when we have this line that this movement developed through Jeff, Jeff is going to have this midnight cry precede the Sunday law, midnight cry then. So that means all of this history that we see here is is a zoom into the Sunday law itself, right? Because the parable of the ten virgins has been fulfilled and will be fulfilled to the very letter, right? So the parable of the 10 virgins is the first and second angel's messages. And in our history, in order for the third angel's message to be empowered, the second angel has to arrive and join it, right? The mighty angel of Revelation 18, which is the second angel's message. And you can't have a third without a first and a second. So that means the first angel's message also had to arrive in our history. And so we can see that it arrived in 1989. And so, so that is the history of the first and second angels' messages in our time. But in our time, because it parallels Millerite history, we have a midnight cry that precedes the Sunday law, just as there was a midnight cry that preceded the close of probation. So this midnight cry in our line is not the loud cry. And that, that was a confusion within this movement that was never clear. So so Jeff, he, he originally would talk about how the midnight cry parallels the loud cry, but then he, he said that we have a midnight cry in our history, which precedes the Sunday law. And he never really differentiated this. He just saw it all as part of the same thing. And in a sense it is, but it is something happens first within Adventism so that we can pass the Sunday law test and give the loud cry. So the whole purpose of this movement and this understanding is to give a message to Seventh-day Adventists that we can stand at the Sunday law. So 
So what God has given this movement is a part of that. Now, that seems sort of uh, pretty bizarre or extreme to say that us few people here on this study are part of this this message that's supposed to uh, reform the Seventh-day Adventist church, right? It, it, it seems kind of preposterous, actually, you know, that any of us could have any say, part of it. I was going to say big, but preposterous is the big word for big. Yeah. Yeah, right. But this is what has been shown to us. Now, you know, sometimes, you know, in my my ponderings of, of all of this, I said, you know, especially early on, even before this movement, I'd say, well, why does God show me anything? Well, it's probably just for me, right? Like, do other people have to understand everything that I understand or understand it in a way? Or maybe it's just God speaking to me and helping me in my, my Christian walk that he shows me certain things. So I've never had the position, you know, that everybody has to listen to me. And I, and I still don't have that position, right? I mean, I don't, that would be sort of, uh, I don't know, preposterous. <laughs> it, you, know, it, it, you know, God takes care of his truth. He, he raises up whoever he wants and he does whatever he wants. And, and so it, it's not for me to kind of know how God's going to unfold history. But I, I have to study the scriptures for myself. And the, the fact that this movement ended up uh, taking a a date that I had come to understand and proclaiming it, it, it became int got international attention. Sort of leads to the view that maybe you know this this is somehow useful. You know what I had done with chronology and studying the Bible that there's some use in it and that God is going to use it in some way. But I'm I'm not of the position that that's the you know the only th uh, um, that we're the only instruments that God is using uh, to prepare the Seventh-day Adventist church. It'll be interesting to see how all this comes together. But, but we do know that the understanding of Millerite history is extremely important and that this movement has unsealed the seven thunders. That is, we were the only people I know of that understand Millerite history. And um, you know, Kelly and I know Peter Plum, and you know, he he keeps attacking this understanding of Millerite history. He doesn't believe in July 21st, 1844 as as being midnight. He just believes in Exeter. Um as somehow the midnight cry is given only at Exeter. Right? He doesn't like the midnight way mark. He believes that that's an error. And uh, he wrote a paper on it. I responded to it. He never responded to any of my arguments that I showed him why his paper was wrong. But I believe that that we understand this history. I, I don't think it, we can dismiss Samuel Snow's letters or July 21st, Boston, or August 15th at Exeter and say that these are inconsequential, especially in their relationship to 457 BC and the symbols there, right? So that's, that's a whole other study. But what we can say is that this movement has these way marks of Raphia and Paneum and the Sunday law that we have not yet reached. And you can see on the bottom there, we have 2014 to July 18, 2020. I didn't put the 2020 there as this prediction before midnight. When you, when you refer to a date and so on, to help me follow on the chart, can you just point at it with your cursor? Uh, because I find myself scanning back and forth, and I kind of lose okay. focus. So on the bottom here, we have from 2014 to July 18, 2020. This is where we have the prediction before midnight. That's, that's how we've marked it. That is... Um, we could maybe even put it earlier, but then 2014, but that's how we marked it here on this chart. So, so that includes 11.9 and there, we could actually zoom in and create a whole line dealing with that. And that's kind of what we're addressing here in this story of Samuel is that history. But you can see we have a way mark called midnight, which is typified by Raphia and another way mark called the midnight cry that's typified by Paneum. Right. So the second angel formalized and the second angel empowered. And we are not to Raphia yet on that line. We have passed Raphias in, in other lines where we zoomed in 
because we look at January 6th, 2021 as raffia. But that's that's a zoomed in line. But there is this bigger line. And, and that line, we haven't got to midnight yet. So when people in this movement talk about, well, the Sunday law is just around the corner, but we haven't passed raffia or paneum yet. That is, can we have the Sunday law before this message is given to the Seventh-day Adventists and that there, there is a reformation, a midnight cry amongst Seventh-day Adventists? No. Can the, no, it can't, right? So for people saying, well, the Sunday law is going to come under Trump. You know, he's going to become president of the Sunday law. Well, that would mean that Raffi and Paneum have to occur uh, prior to that. Now, there are ways in which they've tried to do that. But since, because they're going to say, well, we passed midnight. Well, if we pass midnight, where is the message? And and where is the midnight cry going to be? Right. So, so that's part of what we've found as we've studied is that there is a lot of things that still have to occur prior to there being a Sunday law. And that people in this movement who want to have a Sunday law, you know, next week or whatever, wherever they're going to put it, putting dates on a line, looking for the Sunday law coming, they're making the same error that Parminder made when he predicted the Sunday law back in 2012. He said there was going to be a Sunday law in 2014. That is, it's a misapplication of, of chronology, of numbers, of symbols, right? That is... The problem is we don't we need to know what line we're in. And, and we believe that time exists in our line as a witness against us, not as a predictive element. Right. We can't predict anything in the future in relation to time. But time does exist as a witness. One is against us, but also uh, as a witness to where we are in history. Right. So that we can we can. We're, we're passing these way marks and we can identify them. So we kind of know where we are, but we don't know when these, these events will occur in the future. So, so we, we can't have a date for like when Raffi is going to occur, when this midnight way mark or when the midnight cry way mark is going to occur or the Sunday law. Because Ellen White says we can't know. And I've maintained that all through this history, right? So all through this time that this movement has been time setting, I've continually presented Ellen White statements that we can't know these events so that whatever these events we were predicting is July 18th, it couldn't be any of these events. July 18th could not have been these major events that Ellen White talks about on her line, right? That is, we can't know the time for the close of probation, the Sunday law, um, you know, uh, the loud cry or any other promise of special significance, right? Now, we have a work of watching and waiting, she says. Now, watching and waiting, I believe, is connected to measuring the time. That is, you know, watching and waiting isn't just uh, closing your eyes and going about your day-to-day -day life and saying, well, one day the Sunday law will happen, right? Watching and waiting is is what we are doing, right? By looking at events as they unfold and connecting them into these structures, line upon line. So is that all making sense to people? I mean, I know we've gone through a lot of this before, but Kelly, you know, hasn't. He wasn't there when we were doing these studies on judges. What you've said so far makes sense, especially the part about Ellen White and, and people trying to get ahead of the head of things. Yeah. Or, Ahead of themselves. Yeah. So so when we look at this line of Ellen White's and we see that Sunday law way mark, that is our history. We are in the history of the Sunday law on Ellen White's line. The Sunday law hasn't arrived, but the mighty angel of Revelation 18 has arrived. And she connects that with the Sunday law. So, so that means when we look at our lines and we we see you know, this here down at the bottom, you know, uh, this parallel of Millerite history. This is a zoom into 9-11 as the arrival of the second angel's message. That is, there's obviously things that, that preceded it because you needed the first angel's message to occur prior to 9-11. But we are really 
in the second angel's message. That is, the mighty angel of Revelation 18 arrived at 9-11. And so that means we're in the time of the Sunday law. But we now, as just as you come into, you know, when you're driving towards a city, you know, you first, you see it on a map, it's just like a dot, right? But as you as you drive in, you start to see these signs, these way marks, right, as you enter into that city. And that's what we see as we approach the Sunday law. We see these way marks that are just an unfolding of previous way marks. They are parallel. And so we can tell where we are at by these way marks, by these signposts. So we, we can know that we're not at Raphia yet that we're not at midnight, because if we were, there would be a message right now being given to Seventh-day Adventists by this movement. And it would soon be empowered that, you know, people would be taking up this message and proclaiming it um, to Seventh-day Adventists, and that this message would prepare Seventh-day Adventists to pass the Sunday law. And the joining of the two sticks is supposed to occur between midnight and the midnight cry. And that's going to be the Protestants joining us. So there's a lot that happens. Raffia is not some uh, minor event. It's it's something, you know, and, and you could say, well, it was fulfilled on January 6th and in 2021. Well, it was in one line, but that was a smaller line. That was a zoom into a line within this movement. Dealing with what we were making predictions regarding of July 18th and December 25th and Trump and so forth. So those were fulfilled, but that was not this bigger line. Because in, in 2016, Jeff had 9-11, Midnight, Midnight Cross, Sunday Law as these dates that you see above in Millerite history, April 19th, July 21st, August 15th, and October 22nd. And, and we kept saying, or when are we going to get to midnight? And then we would think we passed midnight or we got to the midnight cry. But those were internal lines. They were they were not part of this line. So we're still not to midnight. Because if we were at midnight, we would be Samuel Snow at Boston proclaiming it's midnight. Right. He's at Boston. At midnight. Right. He rides up on the horse to Boston, not to Exeter. He gets there for the. The Sunday service, right? And and he has just a short message to say, right? So he, I, I don't know how long his message was. We have a, abbreviated a version of it in Loughborough, which Loughborough places at Exeter, but it's actually at Boston. And uh, and he puts Exeter at July, so he gets that it's in July, but uh, he puts Exeter at July. Anyway, it's it's I wrote a paper on it. Um, going through all the, all the evidences. But the point is we're not there yet, right? This movement has not got to that point. And, and then Paneum, when that message is going to be empowered. Now, and we also know that there's the king of the north and the king of the south that are connected with that. And so we don't even particularly know exactly how that relates, so, so there's some relationship between the king of the north and the king of the south, because Rafi and Paniam are about the north and the south. And so we, we've had Russia and the United States. We've had the Democrats and the Republicans. But there's some lack in our understanding about how that really relates to midnight and the midnight cry. So whether it's two different ideologies, but they're, they're enemies. They're not godly powers, right? So there, there's lots we don't understand yet and, and what part our understanding plays in how these things unfold, we still don't know. But that, that's kind of where, where we want what we want to do when we, when we're addressing these lines. We need to keep all of this in mind. Any questions about any of this so far? No, but I really like to review, especially the things that need to happen before the Sunday law. Yeah. 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 So when we're going to deal with with uh, uh, this, because right now we 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 put this, we'll say it's a proposal. I propose that that somehow Second Sam or First Samuel chapter two is addressing this line in our history, and the question is like, if we're going to put it there, how do we relate it to other lines? So that's what I want to do on the bottom. 
which I guess we'll have to do tomorrow. But we already had started to do that in that we saw that um, we had taken some of this story that maybe maybe we need more to go further through for Samuel before we really grasp it all. So I, I, I'm not certain what to do on that. You know, and some of this, uh, like we haven't really dealt with any of the Hebrew numbers in any kind of detail other than uh, we dealt with uh, the ephod, right? So we had, uh, right, the ephod, which was 646, uh, the Hebrew number 646, uh, which we know is uh, connected um, to our lines in some way, right? That's 600 and 46 years from uh, July 27th, 1299 to Hiroshima, right? So that's um, on the biblical calendar, <coughs> 26th day of the fourth month. So, um, and so that relates to our understanding of uh, Revelation 9 and so forth, the symbols attached to that. And, and that was one of the things connected with July 18th. So we, we still have to try to understand how these are going to fit in this structure. So somewhere in this, uh, this story, there's something that relates to, to our prediction about July 18th. So, so even in that, that line here, you know, the one at the top, which is the same as the one at the bottom. But when we start, we, there's still more dates that need to go in here that we have to get from this story. So I'm not really sure exactly how to approach it. I think some of this analysis is going to take quite a bit of time um, to really uh, figure it out. I know um, there's some things I had done with some of this analysis that I got to go through again. So maybe I'll try to get some of that ready tomorrow. Because I, I, I don't want to just... What's that, Kelly? Uh, would you mind just uh, quickly going over the line that you have here on on the screen, December 12, 21, 2012, and so okay. on. What okay. happened at those dates? Okay, so so December twenty first, two thousand twelve. That's the beginning of the seven 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 chiasm. So that two thousand three hundred and ninety one days. It, is, no. No, just just tell me what they are. Don't don't explain. That's, just tell me what they are. No. Well, December twenty first, twenty twelve. The beginning of this. It's the Mayan prediction. Okay. It's supposed to end. Beginning of the seven seven seven. Yeah, it's the beginning of the seven yeah, seven. September twenty third. In September, go left to right for me, please. That's seven hundred and seventy seven days before November ninth, two thousand nineteen. And that is the failed prediction of the evangelicals that the secret rapture was supposed to happen on that date. Okay. But I'm also at Lambert Church presenting July 18th as a symbol of the prediction before midnight on that date. And it's okay. going to be, yeah. It's going to be the first day. It's going to be Rosh Hashanah on the biblical calendar. Right. And then and September it's, 23rd, 2017. Okay. That's the one I'm talking about, September 23rd, 2000. Oh, and then October. The failed uh, Protestant uh, yeah. rapture prediction? Oh, I think, yeah. okay. Yeah, and then yeah. October 13th, 2018, uh, that was a predict predicted date by Daniel from Brazil, that the midnight cry would be given uh, by Parminder or Tess in, in Lambert Church, but he ended up doing the presentation, and then I measured from noon when he was doing the presentation, I did the calculation actually at noon and counted 391 and a half days to midnight on November 9th, 2019. It says 392 days, but That's, it's 391.5. And is, is that kind of what, is that kind of what Jeff was thinking about in the quote that I posted in the chat? And, and is okay. that also when, when people were thinking they were going to be sinless or whatever? Stop sinning, yeah. I mean? Yeah, that close of probation would be November 9th, close 2000. Yeah, for, for the priests. And that they, and that let yeah. him that is righteous, though, which I opposed right from the beginning. That, that and I, do you think that, 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 
Do you think that's uh, kind of what Jeff was thinking in the when he said those things? No. Probation was about to close, and we need to wake up. And the Sunday maybe, maybe. Trump is going to be probably disposed or I don't, impeached. I don't know. And... Yeah, I don't. I don't. Uh, I'd have to. It was yeah. just before that, October October nineteenth, two thousand nineteen, or October ninth, or I forget. Yeah, and then we got seven hundred and seventy seven days to December twenty fifth, twenty twenty one, the end of our our structure that we had for the November 9th, July eighteenth, December twenty fifth. So there's more to that structure, but 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 that's the end of the the whole structure. So we're just saying that. This message of First Samuel addresses this particular understanding within this movement related to time that was revealing the problems in the movement. That is, this movement had in it the sons of Belial, that is, the worthless people, right? People that are not aware of that they're mishandling God's word, they're misrepresenting God. Yet they're they're standing in this place as supposedly supposed to be representing God. And that's what I believe this line illustrates. This story of Samuel illustrates this movement, this history in that time. Um, and so, so Belial being Eli's two sons or. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So the, the yeah. pugilist and the mouth of the serpent which describes the character of people in the movement in that time. Definitely Parminder. Yeah, and others. Right. I'm sure. I mean, you could put Mark Bruce, Bruce as the pugilist and Parminder as the mouth of the serpent if you want. Yeah, yeah, that, that fit. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I, I think it's just generally a characteristic of us in this movement at that time. And so the message that was to correct this was a message in relation to time that was brought in by Parminder, uh, but then uh, God gave light as a witness against what Parminder was teaching using time, right? So so the reason why, you know, I was here, um, well, I was a part of the movement was to expose Parminder his teaching and 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 so it came it, it there was this conflict between what Parminder was teaching and what I was teaching in regard to Tara. And then that that just manifested itself in the July 18, 2020 prediction, which was still misused, right? Still misunderstood. But it was a test to us. So November 9th ended up separating the false priests from the movement. You know, Parminder's group and so forth. Uh, but July 18th was meant to reprove us and and correct us. And uh, so, you know, we saw that when we went through the Book of Judges. But we're, we're, we're just going to have to come back to this tomorrow. Yeah, and the 2,391 days, uh, Stephen uh, mentions that it's in, uh, it's actually on October 22nd, 2391 B.C., uh, that the flood began. That's when uh, the door of the ark was closed. It was on the October 22nd, uh, 2391 BC. So, yeah, thanks for pointing that out, Stephen. Okay, well, let's uh, close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the study here this morning. I pray for each person that you can bless them today. I'm thankful because here in Canada, it's Thanksgiving but I'm always thankful. And uh, I just pray that you can bless each person as they seek your presence each day. And bring us together again to study your word. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.